Uh, hi everyone, uh, welcome to the, this webinar on post-production tools. My name is Lisa, producer at Fordia Studios, uh, and I would like you to introduce our, to our volumetric video director and host, Ty Holema. Um, we're still waiting on a few people, so we just start and then I'll let everybody in. So enjoy the webinar and I'll give the floor to Steiner. Let me unmute myself and share my screen. It should go all right. Okay. Lisa, do you think I should start or do you want to wait a little bit further? I think you can already start a little bit. All right. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar about post-production tools for volumetric video. I'm Staya Hallema and as Lisa said, I work as a volumetric director at the 4DR Studios. This means that I help clients to record their captures in the best possible way. And one of the things I help with is explaining what is possible with the captures afterwards in mostly the game engine or a 3D program. Because that greatly dictates what you will record and how you will record it. So I'm very excited to be part of this webinar together with three amazing companies, 40 Fuse, Arcturus, and Sense of Space. Uh, does this button work? Hmm, interesting. Oh, I'm very sorry for this. I am very bad with teams, but I don't get my slide to go to the next one. Maybe this works. Yay! All right. So let me introduce our own studio. Uh, we are called the 4DR Studios, and we are based in the innovation hub of Holland, the city of uh, Eindhoven. And we employ the 4D Fuse system called Holosys. Uh, I think Richard is going to explain better, but let me try to do that very briefly. Basically, it comes down to that we have a system of 32 cameras pointing in, filming from 32 different uh, directions. And when all these images are uh, magically put together, they create volumetric video which comes down to basically we film the images, they become a 3D mesh, and then the texture is applied and you get 3D video. And I have a couple of examples for the people that have never seen it. This is uh, a project we did for a museum. So here you see real actors in uh, a virtual environment. Uh, one project I'm really proud of is, oh, let me turn that noise down. So this is uh, a really good uh, uh, soccer player, Wijnaldum, uh, who plays in our national soccer team, and we recorded them for an augmented reality uh, campaign. Here you see him in my own studio, and next to that, I can maybe press play, you can see him uh, as a giant on the field while we were beating Turkey with 6-1, which was a wonderful moment. Um, let me go further. Or what you can also do with volumetric video is creating out of this world VR experiences like this one. So, um, in other words, with 3D video, uh, you can tell wonderful stories in many ways. Is it, is it uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, or in the form of virtual production? Because you can also use these characters in 2D uh, productions, of course. And we're just at the start of it all. But the main thing is that 3D video means that we can use real people with all their real expressions in game engines or 3D programs. Well, that's at least the promise. Every one of you that has ever worked with Falcap knows that it's not that easy yet. And that's why I am super excited that we are hosting these, this um, uh, webinar because uh, help is coming. Uh, we've invited three companies that all in their own ways make tools that help us mold and shape the Falcap recordings in ways that you want to use them. They address things like editing, cleaning up the meshes and the textures, as well as prepping them to become more interactive. But also in the form of distribution, really building the pipelines to help get your project where the player, participant, or viewer can see, or probably better said, 
experiencing experience it um, so there's three programs I've been in contact with all of uh, all of them and I've always been inspired by their amount of knowledge their enthusiasm for this new medium and their helpfulness they are somewhat competitors but I believe this field is so broad and not in, unimportantly it's gonna grow so big that it's very okay and definitely a wonderful privilege to have them in the same webinar showcasing the rich possibility that Falcap will bring. The first speaker is uh, Richard Broadbridge, CEO of 40 Fuse. Uh, I can only say like take it away Richard. Uh, and I have to well, all right share well, it. Be my pleasure. Let me get my slides going. Hello to everyone. Thank you for coming. As Dai has said, it's quite a, an exciting time as this uh, whole area starts to open up for more and more content creators. Uh, I'd like to thank 40 r for inviting us here. It's uh, quite a pleasure. And uh, as Dai mentioned, we have the pleasure of presenting here alongside with two of our strong partners, both Arcturus and Sense of Space. So you're going to have a, an excellent vision of end-to-end uh, -end solutions, how you can both create stories and get them out to your audiences. Uh, for my part, I'm going to focus on uh, what we do, which is working uh, upstream, both on the studio side and also in the post-production side. So I thought I would share with you briefly uh, a slide about our company and then talk about our main workflow, which we focus around three actions, the capture part of a, of a, of a project, the build section, and also delivering this to the, the final audience. So as a company, 40 Views is located in France. We're in Grenoble, which is one of uh, French's two Silicon Valleys, the other one being Paris. Uh, we started, uh, we really came from French uh, public uh, research, and we started with our first capture system in the market 2007. So that makes 14 years of experience to develop technology and uh, work on creating interactive content with a variety of content creators and entrepreneurs around the world. It's been a very exciting uh, project all along. Uh, we're not, we're still not, at a massive adoption yet, but we can see signs of it coming and see progress being made uh, month by month and year by year. So there's so a lot of new stories uh, that have been told and are coming out as well. So it's a very exciting time, as Daya had, had mentioned. When we think about how to make a, a story, we think about really our core technology, the first one we created was about capturing, capturing high quality content. Once you've done this, you also need to uh, do what we call build, and you need to have some uh, ability to do post-production work, and finally you need to deliver it to the audience. So for the very first part of this presentation, I'm going to talk primarily about the, what we've done, historically done, which is the capture part and the deliver part. So the capturing part, that's where the 40R Studio comes in, into play. They have a 32 camera system. You can see an example of one here in those images. The middle one is a picture of a studio um, capturing a character in costume. Uh, the system has a control section, and it has a lot of processing stored. So it's sort of three parts to the holosys itself. And when you're working with a holosys, uh, your main, one of your main goals with 4D R Studios is going to be working on your pre-production planning to make sure that what you film in studio is what you want to have afterwards. And then it will be, you'll be having uh, the work captured with system during the actual shooting day or days and then processed and turned into volumetric video. So historically, the way that works is you shoot with the holocyst, which is in the top middle of the slide. Hope you can all, can all see. And then you process everything into volumetric video. And then historically, you had two output formats. You had the Alambic format on the left-hand side, an industry generic format, allowing you to use third-party tools like Maya or Cinema 4D or 3ds Max or Blender. And then we had our own format, the 4ds format, which we uh, designed to help people use um, our Unity plugin, our Unreal plugin, and a library for um, web pages. And also a format that allows you to work with the two partners I mentioned, which is Arcturus and Sense of Space, who have their own tool sets, uh, excellent tool sets, and delivery systems as well. So historically, that was what we we delivered, allowing people to capture, and then deliver it via these different methods. And so in terms of overall partners, we have several of them. 
you can go in a lot of different directions depending on what your client or your audience wants. And of course, today we're working closely with our tourist intensive space and also providing for those who want to get in themselves and do the, the development themselves, plugins for Unity and for Unreal. Most of this stuff is available uh, on our creators platform. So if you have any need for materials or questions, you can find a variety of stuff there on our website. Things went well, but nonetheless, we could found uh, over time, a number of storytellers didn't have enough tools. There weren't ways to smooth over some of the rough edges of volumetric. For example, you didn't have to shoot sequences, then do simply cut from one sequence to the next. No visual smoothness, no transitions. There was, there was a lot of problems, and we decided that a new tool would be helpful to help people really construct more complex stories, branching stories, visually um, smooth and beautiful stories. So we decided to work on this middle phase we call build and provide a new tool. That tool we called uh, 40FX. And 40FX is a tool which we spent several years building and it works with uh, the volumetric video that's made by the Holocyst and allows you to do a bunch of stuff to it to really get it ready for your final uh, delivery system to your audience. So if I return to the previous diagram where we had the Holocyst sort of from the top and the middle making either 40S data or lambic data and going through those different um, delivery systems you see on the screen, what we added was a new system uh, where now the Holocyst and 40R Studio system can output a new format called 40 raw data. And this data is designed to go into uh, our new tools, which there are two of them that go hand in hand in the same step. One is called 40FX and one is called 40 Coda. 40FX is sort of the effects post-production work and 40 Coda allows you to, to bake in all of the stuff you did in 40FX and bring it back to the two previous formats of 40S and Alambic. So actually all of the workflows we had before still exist. Um, what we've added is an intermediate step allowing you to take more control over how the data will be seen and used uh, before it gets to the, to the audience. As an overview, 40FX um, is an NLE editing tool. And it allows you to do a bunch of stuff with the meshes. Uh, and you work on uh, textures as well. You can build transitions into your sequences, uh, time effects, and tracking effects. Those are some of the features of uh, 40FX. So you shoot your sequences. You bring them out of the Holocene in the right format. You do this kind of work. And then you move over to 40 Coder, where you're going to decide uh, how you're going to encode this for your final presentation. Maybe working uh, with a target of presenting on cell phones. It may be a streaming web page. It could be a headset. Uh, it could be VR. It could be AR. So there are a variety of things you want to control, such as uh, output format, um, the sizes of your meshes and textures, and also the the compression um, you might want to use depending on whether you're streaming uh, or and or how strong or how strong the hardware is in the particular headset you might be using, for example. In more detail. Um, these are some of the features. Uh, we're going to just fly through them today because we have a, just a, an overview approach today. So you can see with your meshes, you can deform them, simplify them, remove some flickering. Uh, you can do a look at approach. You can remove certain artifacts if you have a, a large issues, uh, sorry, issues on the edges of your zone. Uh, for your textures, you can use lookup tables. Uh, you can do vintage coloring. You can simply adjust the colors. You can blur things and sharpen things. And you can load in um, external textures if you would like. With FX, you can also, for FX, you can also do transitions. And you can see in the top right image, we're hearing a morphing from one sequence to another. We try and create a seamless, uh, a visually seamless change from one sequence to another. You can scale things up and down size. You can do a vortex effect. Uh, in time effects, you can do slow motions, fast forwards, you can freeze time, and you can do uh, time reversal. Uh, one question that comes up sometimes in regard to time effects is, well, well, I can slow things down with 40 effects, but I could also do that, for example, in Unity. Why wouldn't I do it there? Well, one of the answers is you might want to um, pre-create your effects and bake them into the sequence uh, so they're part of the final file going to Unity. So that Unity has, for example, or Unreal, they both have less work to do. Rather than having to calculate, their job simply is to play the file as it is because you've pre-baked in uh, many of these, of these effects. 
And finally, uh, with 40 effects, we do um, tracking work. We do point tracking and rigid tracking. So to give you an example, this is a, a sequence of a shot of, in some of the studio standing against a wall. But of course, in studio, we can't use a wall. It blocks too many of those 32 cameras. That's Daya mentions. So here we're using uh, a mesh um, puppet filter to reposition uh, the, the sequence so that the character will then lean against the wall uh, in the final sequence. Another example uh, of a filter we would use would be tracking. Here we've shot the basketball player, added a little city d decor around him, and I'm using some rigid tracking to put on some glasses and uh, keep them on the head while the sequence runs. Another example would be some time effects. Here we have some slow motions and freezes, and even a morphing, actually, which is right about there. Um, these effects are baked into the uh, sequence, and so as I said, when you go to the delivery, the delivery engine, be it Unity, Unreal, or something else, simply has to play the sequence. It doesn't have to calculate how to do the slow motions or other effects on the fly. Finally, uh, a quick example I brought was an example of a, a look at. Um, this is one of our newer features that came out recently. So we're using this to keep the retarget the heads and the gaze of the five characters on us to keep the user engaged uh, while they're enjoying the experience. So these are some of the things, um, some of the things that you can do with 40FX and 40 Coder. And that really brings us to uh, our conclusion, which is in the three steps of capturing data, uh, building the right effects into it and then delivering it, we encourage you to work on your pre-production planning skills and then capture with the Holosys at 40R Studios. In the build phase, um, you're free to use 40 effects and 40 coder to build in some of those effects to lighten the load uh, and be more precise about what you want and when you, before you get to your presentation stage. And then to work with our plugins or with our partners uh, to deliver things to your final audience. So that's what I have to say about a quick overview, and now I will pass the microphone, as it were, back to the team. So that should be me then. <laughs> All right. Um, thanks, uh, Richard. This is so so cool, and uh, I've been working with it. It works all really like flawlessly. I'm really amazed how uh, your team is like. I don't know what, what you use, but I, I want it too. It's really, really cool. Um, uh, I would say, like, I don't see any questions yet, and I think it would be good to, to keep the questions for the end of all the talks. Of, um, uh, so we can uh, go to Ewan straight away. Great. Thank you. Let me just present my all right. um, presentation. Second, and hopefully everyone is seeing uh, our first slide. Excellent, um, and I assume that means you can hear me as well. Um, perfect. Uh, great. Thank you very much, Staya uh, and Lisa and 40 r Studios for putting together this webinar. I really appreciate um, the opportunity to present with all of our great collaborators. Richard, thank you so much for such a great introduction to the whole capture and processing space. It's, it's a pleasure to uh, start with that at framework for everyone and for the great work you guys have been doing uh, building out your editing tools. Uh, so I'm Ewan Johnson, I'm one of the founders of Arcturus and our chief product officer. And uh, we founded Arcturus in 2016 because we saw this move towards spatial computing and the need for, for human performances to be everywhere. And we really believe that volumetric video is the only possible way to create a, a scalable and creator-friendly approach to, to bringing human performance into AR, VR, and the web. And drawing on over 20 years of production experience building pipelines for Pixar Animation, DreamWorks, Autodesk, um, 
and, and many other great companies in, in the San Francisco Bay Area, we recognized that artists were really going to need tools that were going to be friendly and flexible for that essential step of building and delivery. So what we focus on is the editing, compressing, and streaming of volumetric video. And we had the great fortune of collaborating with pretty much everyone on this panel and everyone in the industry building volumetric capture tools. And our core focus has been interoperability and allowing artists to, to use the best tools for the best section of their workflows. Uh, so the ability to say, start with creating mesh stabilization within uh, Holosys with 40 views and then using our tools for compression or cleanup or using our tools for stabilization. So uh, we really believe in, in allowing the artists to have a fluid workflow between the tools that are going to get them the best results for what they're trying to achieve at any one moment. Uh, our platform really consists of two components. Hollow Edit is a cloud-based processing service for editing volumetric video. Many of the tools uh, that Richard mentioned, such as Mesh Cleanup, seamless blending, uh, compression, all live within our, our platform. And we provide compression up to 95% from the original raw data size, enabling really efficient distribution across mobile and, um, the, and the web. Also enabling long clips. One of the things that we really recognize is that as creators grow the types of projects that they're building with volumetric video, they're going to need longer and longer clips. And those need to be easy to manipulate and work with. We've uh, compressed and delivered up to 18 minutes worth of continuous clips on the Oculus Quest. Uh, Creating interactive performances and uh, branching narratives is crucial to bringing volumetric video into the storytelling area. Era. And within that, uh, we have two core tools that are part of our general process. We have uh, what we call skeletonization, which is the automatic creation of a control rig for puppeting uh, the volumetric capture which can be used in two core ways. One of them is you can go in and you can edit and alter the performance of the a capture and then bake that into your final volumetric uh, video so that it is uh, just playing back as if that had been the original capture. And then in addition to that, what we call dynamic retargeting, which is the ability to have the performance alter and follow, say, the viewer's head for head tracking, or if the arm wants to reach out and uh, hand you through something. One of the things that we've really focused on also is the distribution and back end, uh, working very closely with uh, Unreal and Unity and um, eighth wall and many of the distribution engines to ensure that our, our plugins and file formats play efficiently a, within them and provide a lot of access for creators to, to work uh, with um, their volumetric video as they build interactive experiences or deliver directly to, to the web. Um, within this entire system, we built it as cloud-based uh, for processing. And our reason for doing this is to remove the a artist friction from waiting for getting any results. So uh, we can compress extremely efficiently, say, for example, less than 15 minutes to take a one minute clip and run it through our compression system uh, without any uh, noticeable loss in quality or playback. Um, and then publishing is a breeze within Hollow Edit. Uh, you can directly publish uh, back to Limbic or external formats for reintegration into 
uh, other smile formats, such as uh, Richard showed with uh, 40 views, or you can uh, publish to our OMS file format, which is encoded, uh, includes our compression and the dynamic retargeting tools, or directly to Holostream. Holostream is a true adaptive bitrate streaming solution for volumetric video and provides on-demand playback with very limited buffering um, that adapts to your network speeds. And we ha um, have tested and delivered uh, adaptive bit rates from 40 megabits per second all the way down to, to 3 megabits per second. And the most important thing is on the back end, the player, the, the, the consumers don't have to think about this as their device moves from say, high-speed uh, Wi-Fi connection off into 5G and then down into LTE speeds as they're watching volumetric videos, they move through the city. It just naturally adapts for them. Uh, the entire system is built on global industry standard CDNs, so you don't have to worry about will the, the performance be consistent and always available to our users, and it has been uh, stress tested and utilized uh, across very scalable interactive experiences up to uh, uh, 10,000 simultaneous viewers at once. And the most important thing is I like to refer to it as, as one asset to view everywhere. Uh, the same streaming MPD that you use to add and experience to Unity, it can also be used with Unreal, and then directly within uh, a web page. And one example of this is a recent uh, e-commerce example produced uh, by Crescent Japan for Anae. It was a long-running e-commerce example where over 19 outfits were captured using volumetric video, using the 40 view system, as a matter of fact, uh, compressed and delivered by a hollow stream, both interactively within the web page and within eighth wall, so that viewers could preview their outfits and also um, see them in AR as well as um, scrub around them. And the campaign results were outstanding. They over they more than doubled the traffic to the site, the time spent on the site, and the click-throughs. Um, and as far as we're aware, this is both the first full use of volumetric video in e pure e-commerce applications. There were great examples of this produced earlier last year with the Balenciaga exhibit as an event, uh, but this was live for over six months. Um, and was fully interactive and embedded directly within their true e-commerce website. Um, that gives you a great short overview of, of the work that we've been doing. Uh, look forward to doing a longer or in-depth introduction to Hollow Suite, including some of these workflows in action on November 18th. Um, and um, at that, I'll hand this back to Staya. Thanks, Ewan. Really awesome. Um, I don't see questions yet about this, but we have a question around after this, and also probably a little bit of an explanation how the workshops will be, uh, be will be held exactly. So it's up to Victor Pardino. I think I pronounced that correctly. Hi, can you hear me? Let me put my timer. I can hear you. Good. That was a great uh, pronunciation. Thank you, Stai. This. Can you see my screen? Great. Again. So hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Stai. Thank you for the uh, for the for the invitation. It's great to be here. Uh, with Richard and even also from 4D Views and Arcturus. 
uh, I'll be talking about sense of space. Uh, we are definitely the youngest ones around here. Uh, we are just three years old, pretty much a startup, and working very much on my startup style as well on this on this uh, field. Uh, this is our whole team, so not a big uh, company, just a, a small startup doing, uh, you know, solutions, trying to to find clever ways and intelligent ways to help companies work with the volumetric video data and we are quite uh, multicultural as you can see we have Finnish people Brazilians Dutch and also Russians in this very small team um, and I will show a video of SenseXR which is our tool for volumetric video which is a uh, an editing tool, but n not that uh, high end has uh, for the effects and Arcturus is a bit more towards, uh, you know, fast workflows. More like a, if you think of an iMovie for volumetric video, the idea is to get uh, people, you know, entering this field as fast as possible, not being overwhelmed with a difficult tool, uh, with a lot of, you know, words that they don't even know what it means. Is more like a, our goal is to be the, the first door, the, the entrance to this uh, workflow. So we, we aim to do things pretty clear and easy and fast and to work with volumetric video data. And then when you find, found out about this, you have this first touch. You love it. You think it looks amazing. You can get, then go from there, uh, starting doing more complex workflows. Uh, with SenseXR, uh, so the idea here, as I said, is, the, is a small tool uh, for fast editing and get things going, also with audio and also uh, any 3D models that you can put together on your scene. You can put holograms together even from different sources. Uh, we have uh, native format support, which means you can use 4DS, for example, if you capture a 4DR or if you capture a Microsoft and use Microsoft MP4. Or if you capture a Theta V, uh, we have a lot of formats from from all the different studios, uh, and you don't need any plugin to 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 install or anything like that. Everything's already implemented on the tool. Also, OBJ sequences. So if you use, for example, Kinect based uh, capture solutions, you can also use inside SenseXR and even mix different sources. Uh, you can, of course, edit. Uh, as I said, we don't have any, you know, mesh morphing or more advanced features like uh, like you can you can get with 4D effects, for example. Our goal is a bit more straightforward, uh, you know, very simple editing to get you going. And you can publish your hologram with just one click. That's also something really important for us. So while we really focus on sense of space is on the cloud-based compression and conversion, which means uh, once you are done with your with your editing or you have this data that is a bit big, you cannot show anywhere. You have to send a Dropbox link for someone to download. You don't want to do that. You can just drop into SenseXR, click a button that calls publish to web, and that will publish right away to the web and get you a web link and a QR code that will be running the data right away in WebAR and also on a web. And then you can just send the web link to your customer, your friends, any, anyone, and they will be seeing the hologram right there uh, without having to download or anything like that. And get excited about and get your projects, you know, uh, accepted and running, and you get the money to do a bigger project. And or also it works very well also for fast campaigns that needs to happen, you know, in a week. We have been doing now campaigns actually in a week we can do. We can capture, get it done, and get that in WebAR. There's no code involved or anything like that. It's just, you know, press a button and the magic happens on the cloud. And of course, we have also a lot of integrations and plugins. So 3JS safe frame, that means you can run as well in eight walls, up our play canvas, anything, or, or any of these engines that are web-based, uh, you can run your holograms inside there using our plugins and also Unity and Unreal as well. Uh, and they also go streaming. So we don't, we really don't work with downloading data. Everything is being streamed from the cloud. This means that your Unity project, for example, will be much smaller because the volumetric data, it's not actually in the project. 
uh, everything is being streamed from the cloud and that makes our project to be like uh, you know 200 megabytes instead of uh, 15 gigabytes uh, that nobody wants to download that and once your hologram is uh, uploaded from SenseXR, you will have your online hologram platform where you have all of your holograms there with their web links and the KR codes. And you can also uh, open them in a web editor, which means you can add, you know, images, logos, 3D models to start uh, making your web AR experience or also your desktop web experience uh, using uh, simple web coding. So if you know JavaScript, or a 3JS A-frame, you can, you can code a full web AR experience using our holograms and also link different holograms, making buttons. When you press a button, we call another hologram from your hologram library, and you can share all that with a simple web link and a KR code. There's no need for downloading apps or anything like that. And after, uh, so you can, for example, embed your hologram in any website, very simple, uh, like just with a knife a frame i frame <laughs> code little snippet you can put on your website the hologram running there and also in web ar we have our own uh plane tracking web ar tracking system and of course you can also use a to our zapar or any other platform as well but we do have our own uh, web ar tracking and you can share also in vr using unity or unreal or any of the vr platforms once that's published, you can also, we also have this cool dashboard where you can see all the data that you're getting from the hologram on the web. So you can see, you can monitor the views from each country. You can see exactly how many views from exactly which country in the world uh, is, is seeing your hologram. You can learn where the traffic's coming from, if they're coming from a website that, you know, publishing an article using your hologram, you can check that. And if you have buttons on your experience, that's actually something really cool. We did a project for the NBA Finals uh, where the artist had two songs, has a hologram, you had to choose which song you want to listen. And we could get uh, exactly how many people at each country, each country, no, each region in the US chose each song. And that was really valuable data for the artists to know uh, and, and find out why. Certain people in certain regions were choosing this song, certain people in that region choosing the other song. Of course, for e-commerce, that's extremely valuable also. Uh, if you know how many people are choosing the red shoe or the, or the green shoe for, that the hologram is using. So you can really deeply analyze uh, what's going on with your data over there. Uh, I can try to do a little live demo. I still have like some two minutes. Let's see if nothing breaks. <laughs> uh, so let me just show you a little bit here. So this is, for example, me just captured at, actually at 4DR Studios uh, some days ago. And this is SenseXR. Uh, so you, and as I, I showed you, you have here your timelines. You can also use audio and also, you know, a 3D object uh, that is not actually volumetric. Oh, Victor, I, I think I'm seeing your, your uh, keynote. Or your uh, oh. slides, not the not the site. Okay. Ah, yeah, it, it vanishes. Uh, maybe I have to re-share. Hmm. Yeah, I can. I can't choose like a the whole screen. Now you see, right? I do. Yeah. So this is SenseXR, for example. This is me captured at 4DR uh, Studio some weeks ago. I was there. And yeah, as I showed you, you can do like some simple editing here. You can also work with audio, so you can synchronize audio and you can also use, uh, you know, uh, a traditional uh, 3D models to put together with your, with your capture. Once you're happy with what's going on, you can come here and publish to the web, give it a name and hit publish and that will turn the hologram into a web ready streamable uh, hologram this will turn into a KR code and we also get your web link here to check your hologram right away on the web and just let me see if this works I doesn't I have to stop all the time go back here
Yes, and just to finish off, as I said, you have here on our, this is the web account you have, and all your holograms will be on your hologram library. So everything that gets published from SenseXR will be sitting on your hologram library, all with the, the link and the QR code where you can check right away the hologram uh, running on the web. And if I can, and this is, for example, also the analytics dashboard where you can see how many people are checking uh, everywhere in the world, which phones they are coming, which buttons they are pressing, how many views and sessions, and so forth. So this is all from, from SenseXR. Uh, the idea, as I said, is to edit and get published right away pretty fast and learn how people are interacting with your holograms and our goal is to be the first uh, step for you on the volumetric journey. So yeah, thank you. Thank you a lot, Stai and 4DR for this. And you can go to our website to see how much things cost. It's really accessible prices and you can start right away. I give it back to Stai. Thanks, uh, thanks, Victor. Um, I thought maybe before we uh, go to the questions, um, to emphasize that we're going to do like real workshops. Uh, I'm sharing the dates here. So with 40 views, it will be Tuesday the uh, 16th of November. With our tourists, it will be Thursday the 18th of November. And Tuesday the 23rd, we will be doing a uh, uh, workshop with Sense of Space. Um, we are actually still figuring out how to do that like for real, for real. But one thing uh, what, we're, what we are uh, offering is we have uh, our space in Eindhoven with uh, eight computers with uh, crazy fast um, graphical cards. Uh, but I thought maybe, Richard, you and, and Victor, it would be nice to give you a short uh, moment to explain what you would like to do with the audiences on the workshops. Is that possible or are, you, are we still too much figuring that out? I thought it would be great to do that now so everyone is like fired up and wants to come. Uh, this is Richard. I can say we're really looking forward to it. I think we're still preparing uh, the content of the workshop, so uh, hopefully we can put it into an announcement coming up, coming up soon, very soon. Okay, if that's possible. Um, this is is you and uh, similar. We're still fine tuning the the presentations, but they are going to be a combination of tutorials and workflows, demonstrating and teaching people how to to go through our tools and, and the different core aspects from compression through um, other elements of what I mentioned earlier. Cool. Yeah, for us, uh, I think we'll be more like a hackathon, you know, uh, just using the tool together, getting things published right away and checking what works best or not. Uh, yeah, as I said, on our web editor, when the holograms are published, you can go really crazy there. You can mix 3D animation, videos, text, uh, interactions. So we can explore quite a lot what we can do uh, for AR or also for the desktop and, and the game engines. Cool. Uh, Lisa, would you like to share some hard data about the workshops as well? Like where, how, where people subscribe and how they do that? Uh, yeah. Uh, for the workshops, uh, you can uh, go to the LinkedIn event, uh, the same LinkedIn event we have for this uh, webinar, of course. Uh, and after this webinar, there will be uh, links um, that directly uh, lead you to the right workshop. So you can subscribe over there. Um, and then for the workshops, you will get uh, emails from us with more information about it. Um, so that's it. Just go to LinkedIn event uh, and subscribe. I say. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. All right, then I think it will, we would be ready for the for the questions. Uh, I assume that I, I saw only really good questions. Let's let's take them chronologically how they came in. So uh, I have one first one of Russ Johnson. Do you have to shoot on a holosys stage to use the 40 effects tools, or can you bring in an OBJ sequence captured on another stage and use them, Richard? It's obviously. That's a that's a good question. At the current time, you would want to shoot uh, on a Holosys stage to be able to use the 40 effects tool. Yes, you would. Okay. That's a clear answer. Then we should go on to Adriana Poltsin. 
What limitations do you have for slow motion effects? Is it using keyframe interpolation for mesh and texture? How far can you go from, let's say, 30 FPS? How far can you go up or down? Um, I, I guess down, because that's, that requires more interpolation. 40FX has the ability to interpolate missing frames. Um, a classic and easy example is I'm going to take two sequences and use them in the same presentation. Uh, I shot one sequence at 60 uh, frames a second, and the other was at 30. So uh, my base project is 60 frames a second. I'm going to bring in the 30 sequence, and I'm going to ask 40FX to interpolate this, the frames that are missing. So it's really quite a powerful tool. You can go fairly far. Um, I don't think we've tested the absolute limits of, of uh, slow and fast motion, so that would be something to look at in the case of this project. But it will, it will be a case of the asking for effects to interpolate the missing frames. Very clear. I hope that's also clear to you, uh, Adriana, and otherwise you can always chat, of course. Um, Ross Johnson again. The holo edit automatic rigging looks very impressive. I'm assuming that this is currently used that this is that is currently used primarily for physical performance, not facial performance. Is there some roadmap plan for manipulating facial performance in post? Ewan. Hello. Yes, Russ, as you 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 and anticipated right now, it is predominantly used for um, doing body and and head uh, alterations uh, we are looking at and considering how to add facial performance in the future um, but as you can anticipate the nuance of providing facial editing is much more significantly difficult than providing body retargeting. Uh, we are so aware of the emotion and sensibilities that are communicated through how the individual components of our bodies interact, and that's why volumetric video is such a rich and important medium for communicating performance, because you Amen. really do get the full um, feeling, but we recognize that sometime in the future we're going to have to provide editing for facial animation as well. If I may, uh, start to jump in and, and, and add something that I would recommend that when people think about Vomic video, they really focus, even though we now have um, growing post-production tools, um, it really is important to focus on shooting more or less exactly what you want to have in your final sequence. Your, your, the more you're going to stretch or to bend or to change what you shot in something else, the more you want to risk losing the photorealism, which is the, sort of the whole point of mm -hmm. a capture in the in the first place. Yeah, but kind of keying off of what Richard said, I look at what we provide as a way of enhancing and, and interpreting the performance. Um, and it's, it's that get, what gives you that ground truth of reality to then tell your stories in an effective and personal way, um, which CG animation, as much as I spent 25 years producing animated films, struggles to do. It takes so much work to bring that personal moment to, to life. Mm. Yeah, and I think maybe it's like I've I've been really eager for a head retargeting, and there's two companies in this call that are able to do this magical thing. I think that's a really good example of where it actually works. Um, um, that, like, I have tested um, uh, in virtual reality a shot of a little boy looking at the viewer, having his thoughts like. Uh, uh, kind of like popping out of his head and I've tested it on audience and I've asked them how much did you feel involved and like they like I had sentenced people saying like I've never felt so connected to someone I saw in a movie they didn't even know how to describe this which is mm -hmm. like, again, like why what we do is so inspiring um, and there it really works so you really have the real the real movement the real like even the breathing of the kid is like that's that's actually the only thing you need and that's so hard to do, do well his nervousness to do mm -hmm. well with animation and seeing that in volumetric but then that's just this little enhancement of this kid look keep looking at you it's just pure magic yeah. exactly. like that's that's where we, we exactly. find the balance it's just like it's just like even said it's, it's, it's using the tools to to enhance the existing performance yes absolutely 
Cool. Well, let's go on to the next question. For the fuse again by Adriana. Is the tracking tool based on the mesh or texture? How accurate is it? And is there any specific requirements to follow when capturing to make sure tracking will be accurate? Or can it be done on any capture? Very good question. <laughs> Very good question. I'm going to give a sidestepping answer because the answer is to test it out and try what you want to do before you shoot. Then you do a pre-shoot is, is the real answer. Try it out. If you're going to be doing tracking to add a prop, um, it should work more as everywhere. Um, we'd be interested to know if you have a particularly difficult case. And if you manage to make it not work, we'd love to know how you manage to make it, make it not work so we can then go and, and, and uh, improve it even more. Uh, we use tracking to put hats on people, to put swords in people's hands, um, to change uh, a number of things around, to put audio sources. Um, I did a sequence once with 40 effects where I had a person and I morphed them into a a T-Rex dinosaur, and the tracking tracked the mouth all the way through both uh, sequences in, in, in one fell swoop, give us the right audio source. Um, so you want to really um, pre-test what you want to do, and then uh, go from there. Did I answer all the parts of that question, or did I miss a piece? I think it does. Uh, okay. Even, even do you have anything to add to this? I can just only echo what Richard said. I think the most dangerous part about volumetric video is the phrase video. Everybody yeah. kind of jumps to it and says, I know how to plan for a video. And you do need to take time to pre-produce your shoots and plan. Uh, what, where all of our tools work best is where they're enabling the creative process for what you planned for. Yes, we can fix meshes and bad captures. Yes, we can correct a performance that doesn't quite work or, or, or gel and get rid of bad pieces of geometry. But a little bit of pre-planning, a little bit of testing can bring you to the point where what you're doing is you're creating stories, not trying to solve for or, um, mistakes. And I can only echo that as as a photometric director. Like like I think it's really important to test. Like I've been, I think I've hit the 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 the, the edge of, for example, head retargeting with a shot of a kid that holds his controller the way in which he like he has this sensor with which he proves that you exist. But that's a mm -hmm. different story. And he holds it so high that that the system can't really like define anymore what is the neck. And that mm -hmm. makes it really hard. So I've learned now that that shot should be done like this, which is completely doable. So there is, there yes. is, there is definitely um, absolutely things you need to you need to know, and that's I think why it's also important to like test and 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 get help from everywhere anywhere you get an advice. And that's yeah. why I think a, a, a webinar like this is so amazing. And I can only recommend anyone to come to the workshop. Um, can oh, I, there's more questions. Yeah. Sorry, can I just jump in there real quickly, Stai? I just want to add that this is one of the things that's great about this industry and where we are at this stage is that we are all learning how to use this technology, even those of us that have been in it for five years, 14 years, um, and uh, are always eager to, to help. Um, and like, like Richard said, uh, we we put out lots of tutorial videos. We're eager to answer questions. We're eager to help people explore and experiment so that they can understand how to to build their projects. Um, it, and so, uh, not to put words in other people's mouths, but definitely reach out and ask because uh, I know for sure that we love to to help people get off on the right foot. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, then there's one last question. With the options to blend between se sequences, sequences, does it make sense to take that into account in the pre-production phase? For instance, start and end in an idle pose from where you can easily blend. And how much overlap is needed? And is this worth to keep in mind when shooting? Do you have experiences with these, with this? Um, Guys, take it away. I know how to answer, but it can I um, you. can I jump in here? with actually that that remind me of a of one piece to the previous question. Um, which I've now forgotten the current question, but the previous question, there was an additional piece um, about doing tracking. Um, the, you mentioned started doing the 
the look at uh, with the child holding the sensor and having a problem with the neck. Um, one thing we have found in recent work, um, just to go back to pre-production planning and how the post-production can in fact can can impact the, the pre-production. We found that when you're doing sequences where you know you're going to have a look at effect to engage the audience or the, the VR user or XR user directly, you're going to want to shoot a little bit differently. For example, you're going to want to reduce body movement and have in that part of the sequence have the character looking straight at one particular point so that then when you come and add in the look at effect, so twisting the head around, you aren't twisting a head on, on a body or an actor that's already moving in different ways, giving you a very, potentially a very unrealistic result, having the head twist automatically, but also having the body in in movement. So that would be a not a limitation, something to know when you come to the to the shooting part. Yeah, true. And but so, it can also be really good, cool in, in post. By for example, you have because you have a target, you can have an extra target and make someone like in post. You can also be really smart with it. Like for example, yeah. have another yeah. target looking at something, turn that until you get to the next sequence where you look at it again. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah, but that that can definitely. I mean, that's one of those cases where pre-production means that you can focus on how do I make the personal connection of the head retargeting sing as opposed to work. Um, and so we had a very similar case to what Richard described where we had a Shakespeare performer who was incredibly introspective. Like every one, one sentence he would look down and yet they wanted to have head retargeting. And so there was a lot of work to try to keep that head looking straight. Um, to go into the question uh, about clip blending, um, yes, pre-planning and thinking about how your clips are going to blend together in the future is, or when you do the final post work is really important because you want to think about how the movements are going to transition from one to the other. You can make really extreme transitions work with clip blending, but will they feel natural? And so, like, there's a, a great case that I was helping somebody with a few days ago where um, they, it, as they were moving from one clip to the next, the actor at the very end had started to move in a completely different direction. And uh, they were trying to make the blend work by blending the tail end of that clip. And, of course, that uh, didn't feel right, didn't look right, because you had settle and then moving into a, a performance that wanted to go in this direction, but the tail end of the original clip had the performer moving in that direction. So you had a, a, a discontinuity in that. It was easily solved. We actually just trimmed 10 frames off of the original source clip. Thankfully, there was enough tail on that clip to allow it. Uh, but if there had been a tiny bit more planning in, in up front to ensure that when you ended the clip A, you ended in a motion that was conducive to blending into your perceived clip B, uh, everything would have flown a lot more smoothly. Mm. And as a, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I would, I would encourage people to start to do production planning and trying stuff out and starting with smaller assemblies mm -hmm. of clip blending. Um, one thing that we've worked on recently is a, a sequence where the first sequence is a waiting sequence, so the, you, the VR user arrives in a space and the person uh, greets them. But they're in a loop where we've transitioned the sequence to itself. And then as the user approaches at a certain distance, we then, um, through a script in Unity, go from this sort of endless loop of the person waiting for them and or greeting them into a transition into a new uh, text as they're approaching. And then the person approaches and there's a, another event that happens. And so we've sort of lined up two or three or, or four sequences with different transitions and using some event signals um, within the data to launch different scripts. This kind of work is certainly possible. Um, I would suggest starting with, you know, of course, one and then do two and then add a script and, and step by step, really moving forward. Um, we find that people who don't have experience with volumetric, which is probably most of the audience, if they're coming here to learn about what volumetric is. Um, I would say, think of it this way, if you're from the world of, of CG, maybe you don't know uh, VFX, so when you go at it, you should know that you're starting and you just start learning the basic pieces, and the, and the inverse is also true. Um, people who 
are from video. Um, Vibemetric is made of video at the start, but beyond that, it's a very different different creature. And so step by step learning is probably uh, one of the best ways to make um, convincing progress over time. Thanks, uh, Richard. Um, I think we're over time, uh, so I would. I think I'm going to address the last question and, and round it up. Um, Lisa says, I'm a complete outsider to this industry, but I'm just so curious to find out if this is a space where I could participate and tell stories. Thank you for having this webinar. Can you suggest where I might look to learn more and connect? Baby steps. Uh, I, I think what I need for to answer this properly is your definition of the industry. This could be virtual reality, this could be augmented reality, this could only be volumetric video. I don't know what you mean exactly, but I would suggest you look at all the sites of all our companies here. Um, and if it's really VR and AR and like digital storytelling, then I could definitely recommend you to go to some festivals like ITVA Dog Lab here in, um, in Amsterdam, the VR days, maybe Tribeca, Sundance, those kind of festivals have like the, the most forward uh, portfolio works out there. Um, if it's really about telling stories. Uh, guys, this was really awesome. I wish we could do this every Tuesday. Thank you so much for, uh, for being here. Uh, it was really, really a big joy. Um, I can only recommend everyone to come to the workshop. Thank you so much. I wish I had a two now to start and it's like, da da da, we go all the way. <laughs> and thank you, everyone. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.